Please rise as you're able for our call to worship. We are the branches rooted in the vine of Christ. We come because we seek to be connected to Christ and to one another. The branches that remain in the vine bear much fruit. We come because we seek to be spiritually vibrant and alive, so that our lives can inspire others to do the same. If we remain connected to the presence of Christ, then Christ's presence will keep us connected. We come because we seek to be present in Christ, as Christ is present in us, so that we may grow in God's love and hope. Amen. Please remain as you are for our processional song. And you may be seated. Well, good morning, MCC. And welcome. We are so delighted to see you in worship today. This group is growing. Have you noticed? We're growing. I, I told the Lord when I first got here, if we, um, if we had at least 25 people, you know, we could 
keep doing two services on Sunday morning. If we were going to get down, you know, to eight or nine or ten, maybe we should think about doing something differently or moving a time or whatever. And so I, I said, well, I, Lord, if you'll give us 25 every Sunday. And do you know we've had over 25 ever since? I should have asked for 50. I'll pray harder next time. We are delighted to see you in worship as always. If you are new with us, on uh, uh, this is your first Sunday with us, would you just wave at me so I can wave back at you? <laughs> we wave back at all of you. We're delighted to have you in worship with us. And if you're joining us online, we want to say welcome to you. We know that we have people that join us every single week. You're so faithful. And we thank you for joining us online. And so wherever you are in the world, good day. And we're glad you are here. And we hope that you are blessed by being here with us at the Mother Church of our denomination. And for all of you who are present with us in this building, who are always so faithful, we are delighted to see you as well. And so would you take just a moment to welcome one another with the sign of peace. The first reading is taken from the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, from the Message Translation. And that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't remind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here goes. Steer clear of barking dogs, those religious busybodies, all bark and no bite. And they're interested in, all they're interested in is appearances. Knife happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away in this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it. Even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials. You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church. A meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. The very credentials that these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up. And I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. Why? because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my Savior firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going on for me is insignificant, dog done. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all the inferior stuff 
so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I have it made, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Our second reading comes from the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 15, verses 5 through 11, also from the message translation. I am the vine, you are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood, gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourself at home with me, and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my creator shows who God is. When you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I've loved you the way my creator loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done kept my creator's commands and made myself at home in God's love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. So hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, I want to tell you that I woke up in a really good mood today, and we've already been laughing and laughing a lot around here this morning. And, it, and I even told them when we went to prayer a while ago, something is a little off because this sermon is about pressing on, which means there's some people who are going through some things that maybe we're still laughing on the outside and maybe not laughing on the inside. So if you're not going through anything negative or bad in your life, I hope that you will do what the, first, what, what the Apostle Paul said at the beginning of this. I've told you many times, you've heard this before, but bear with me 
I need to say it again just in case. How about that? So I love this rendering of Philippians chapter 3 that keep pressing on. And, and here's the thing. Over a month ago, God gave me this sermon for today. Now, God doesn't often speak to me like months in advance about a particular day, but in this day, and I think it's because I was probably horrified about what this day was bringing. <laughs> For those of you online, I'm getting older and I'm now a baby in the next decade. <laughs> but one of those decades, you know, at the end, you know, when you're in the nines, that's usually when I'm depressed. That's usually when I, and I haven't been depressed about being 59 all, all in, during this last year. And, but because, you know, you're in your late, your late whatevers, right? When it's the nines, the eights and the nines, you... You can no longer be in the babies or the mids. You're in the late. And so now I get to start a whole new decade, right? So I'm in the baby part of the decade. But I think the shock, the shock of it, right? The shock of it. I haven't thought about birthdays in years. 50, yeah. But I didn't think much about it after that until about a month ago. I, was, I looked in the mirror and I was like, can, can you really be this age? Can you really be this old can you really? And, and, and evidently you can. Um, <laughs> and just so you know, I don't usually advertise my birthday because I, I don't really celebrate birthdays very much. I haven't for years. I usually go around, there's always someone, and it was Laura Laws was, was Thursday, and, and so usually mine's around somebody else that I know, and they're having a celebration, and I just kind of come along for the ride, right? So I get to celebrate along with them. But, but this year, I was just, I kept looking in the mirror. This no lie, I kept looking in the mirror. It's like, it really can't be true. It really can't be. Have I been on earth this long? But what happens is, when you have those milestone birthdays, you start taking inventory. And when you've been around this long, you start looking back at where you've been. You start looking way back for some of us, right? Way back. And I remember way back some things that I did. And, and the Spirit just kept saying, keep pressing on, Keith. Just keep pressing on. And then the Lord started showing me some other things. And, of course, if the Lord gives you a message a month in advance, it means, if you've got to wait a month, that some things have to happen in the natural during that month that you don't even know about. And you'll just have to deal with it when you get to it. And we have had some things happen during this month. But I was thinking when I got this, I want you to hear this again, when he says, and that's about it, friends, be glad in God. Let's start there. Let's just be glad in God. No matter what else life brings us, let's just be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here goes. And then he goes on this diatribe I would say steer clear of the barking dogs those religious busybodies anybody had some barking dogs on your heels before and then I started looking at my own life and realized that I used to be one of those barking dogs I used to be one of the barking dogs I could tell you what was wrong in your life and I could tell you that hell was gonna be hot for you isn't that an encouraging word? <laughs> All they're interested in is appearances, knife happy circumcisers, I call them. That makes every man squirm, by the way. <laughs> the real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leaves to work away at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We couldn't carry this off our own efforts, and we know it even though we can list what many think are the impressive credentials. See, Paul has come to another part in his time in life. This is later in his life where he has begun to realize, you know, I used to be one thing and now I'm not that anymore. And now I've mellowed out a little bit where I used to be one of those barking dogs myself and now I'm looking at it from a very different vantage. I have the vantage of age and experience. And I see that real life doesn't always revolve around the laws of any church. Okay, and some, some former Methodists need to hear that this morning. 
Some current Methodists need to hear that this morning. Some current MCCers need to hear that this morning. Some current whatever you are need to hear that this morning. He says, you know my pedigree. Here we go. Let's let the rooster crow a little bit. <laughs> Stick out your chest. You know my pedigree. A legitimate birth. Circumcised on the eighth day, which was the law of the church. An Israelite from the elite tribe, the upper crust, the higher class, the educated, the one with the string of degrees, a strict and devout adherence to God's law. And I'm going to tell y'all, I don't think anybody could adhere to it any more than I did. A fiery defender of the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church. Now, I'm going to tell you a little difference between Paul and me. I haven't physically killed anybody like he did. But in looking back over my life, I wonder how many people I killed their spirits. I killed their trying to live for God because I was the barking dog on their heels. If they did not adhere to the law the way I had been taught it. You see, we Pentecostal folks thought we had a, a, you know, we had a monopoly. We had a monopoly on God, on the Spirit, because we didn't think the Methodists were going to heaven anyway. <laughs> we didn't think the Baptists down the street, nope, they weren't going either. And those uh, free will holiness folks, that didn't even make sense. The title didn't make sense. You couldn't be free will, then it wasn't God's will. <laughs> free will and holiness? No, because holiness had a strict rule of law. And we were all to be cookie cutters of one another. The women had a set of laws and the men had a set of laws. And you better live by them. And we did. We did. At least we thought we did. And the Paul says, here I am with all of this, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. And how many of us grew up believing that the scriptures were not just a road map, but was just a book of laws that must be adhered to at all costs to keep us out of a devil's hell. Yes. That's what we were taught. Yes. It was all about fear. It was all about control. Yes. And I love that in, in, in a blink of an eye, Paul starts remembering his change. He starts remembering that something inside of him changed. That at some point he realized that the scriptures weren't just a book of laws but were something to give us freedom from laws. Yes. Now that's just the opposite, isn't it? Instead of being the barking dog and judging everybody else, maybe I just need to keep a, an eye on my own life and keep working on my relationship, mine, one-on-one -on -one with God. And, and maybe when it says that I'm supposed to work out my own salvation, that I work that out with God instead of the church instead of a preacher or a teacher or someone else. Maybe I need, maybe God trusts me enough, but do I trust me enough to work it out, to work out my own salvation? Hear what happens now. We, we're going to turn Paul around. He's done a 180. Hear what he says. Those very credentials, these people are waving around us something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash. <laughs> Along with everything else I used to take credit for. See, he's going through some aged uh, study too. He's looking back on his life and seeing that things have changed. Those things that I used to have, not, I, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not doing any of that anymore. I've left all that. I'm, th I'm putting it in the trash. All of my degrees and all of my dog barking days are over. Doesn't mean we're against education. Don't hear that. That's not what I'm saying.
He says, and why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my Savior firsthand, I know it for myself, you see. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. I've dumped it all in the trash so that I can embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I don't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, God's righteousness. I gave up all that inferior stuff so I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. If there was any way to get in on the resurrection of the dead, I wanted to do it. If there's any way for me to be resurrected, the real key, not the one putting on a show for everyone else. You say, well, Reverend Keith, didn't you give your heart to God a long time ago? Yes, when I was... Well, let's just say it was 55 years ago. Yes, I was a child, and it meant something. I took it forever. I took it to mean something at five years old that has stuck all of these years. So I didn't throw that part. So you don't throw the baby out with the bath, dirty bath water, right? What was real, I hung on to. What I let go of was all the stuff that went with it and all of the requirements and all of the laws built around. Yeah. That instead of, and let me give you an example. And, and I don't know if they're watching or not. I don't know if any of my folks ever watch me. But one of my cousins, because I really don't know how they feel about me deep down inside. They love me. They hug me. They come to see me when I go home. We all go out to eat together and they... And, and they're very genuine people. But now whether I mix with their theology or not, I don't know. And they know I pastor a church. And they have called on me to pray. Which says they have some confidence in my prayer, right? But I have never been used in the gifts of the Spirit in front of them. And in and, and the last month or two, the Spirit has really been working in, in the gifts to prophesy over people. Mm -hmm. And some of you know it because I've prophesied over you. Mm -hmm. And one of my cousins, every time I go home, she, she corners me after we go out to eat, which I don't mind because I love spending time with her, but I know what's coming. Her daughter is a senior in college, and she is worried because her daughter doesn't like to go to church anymore with them. She doesn't speak the language they speak anymore. She doesn't want anything to do with their church. She said, I've raised her right. I've given her all of the tools that she needs to be successful. And she just wants to sing and play. And now I'm not saying she's not a good student. She's an, a straight A student. And she's doing well in her studies. And then this past week, she, she, or last weekend, she, uh, someone had taken note of her music and asked her to open for a concert. And her parents went to support her, but it wasn't Christian music. A lot of it she wrote for herself. And the child suffers from depression. And how many of those good people that were reared in the church suffer from depression? Yeah. And, not, and they've never been healed. They can shout and speak in tongues all day long. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because I do it to this day. Okay? So don't, don't think that I'm saying there's something wrong with that. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I'm saying that even when you're in the midst of the move of the Holy Spirit, if you're sitting within those laws around you and you're you're just locked in. And my cousin's always worried about her. What, what if the rapture takes place and she's not ready? What if she's not really? Because she's saying sometimes she not, she's not even sure she believes in God anymore. And I keep trying to reassure her that just because she doesn't use the same language, even though she, she, she scares them. She's college age. She's supposed to scare them. 
It's part of it. She's seeking, you see. She's looking outside of the rule book that she grew up with. And this week, I woke up one morning, and I could not get that young lady out of my head. And I kept praying for her, and the Lord gave me a message for her, her mother. So I, I got up to call her, and, and I thought, well, it's three hours later there. She's probably in, at work, and I hate to bother her at work. The Spirit said, write it, because she's going to need to read it again later. How many times does God speak to us? Remember last week I preached about being <laughs> Paul and Silas being in the jail and being stuck to the wall. They're chained. They're chained. And just when you think it can't get any worse, here comes an earthquake. Messes everything up. Right? Sometimes it can even get worse. But I knew the worry, and I felt the Holy Spirit so strong, and I know when that happens that something's coming. And the Spirit said to her, Hear what I tell you. That's a good place to start, isn't it? Yes. Listen. Listen to what I'm telling you. I've got this child. I have my hand on her and have had my hand on her since you dedicated her back to me the first day of her life. The first day of her life, you gave her to me. And I've kept her. And I've guided her. And while she doesn't use the same language that you use and she doesn't follow all of the rules that you follow and that you taught her and you think are so important, if I had allowed her to think the way you all do, now the Lord spoke it a lot more elegantly than this. I should have written it down. I didn't know it was coming out in this sermon. But the Spirit said, had I allowed her to just be where she is, she would have had a small audience. But because of the quiet way that I work with her and because I'm willing to push her out and away from all of that, and, and I didn't even realize it was following in this with all the rules, that she will reach thousands. She will reach thousands with her own music. And maybe it doesn't say Jesus every other chorus in there, but it's still a holy song. And the Spirit said, now it's your turn to get behind her and stand behind her and back her up and really let her go because I've got her. I have her in my hand because you gave her to me a long time ago. And how many of our parents didn't want, they dedicated us to the Lord and gave us to God, like Hannah, right? In the Old Testament, go back and read up on Hannah about how they dedicated us to God, but then they want control. <laughs> they want to get, you know, I want you to live just like me. I want you to live by this rule book. And I'm going to tell you, I put my daddy through some hardships. I'm going to just tell you. Here he has a gay son sitting on the piano stool at church. And he's supposed to be preaching against me and preaching me into hell. And yet the Holy Spirit in me and doesn't know what to do with me. And he wrestles and wrestles and wrestles with his theology just as I wrestled and wrestled with mine. Yes. And thank God, just a few weeks before he passed away, he said to me, son, I just want you to be happy. I just want you to be happy. I want you to live the life God's called you to live because you won't be happy unless you do. And he said, and if anybody comes near you, they're going to have to go through me. Boy, that'll put it in you, won't it? That'll put some fire in you yeah. to know you're supported, to know. So I don't know what you have been going through. Something different than what you grew up with, maybe. We know that the United Methodist Church went through an earthquake this week. Yes. We knew it was coming. We didn't know exactly where it would go. But the people voted and decided that they won't acknowledge their GLBTQ clergy members. They're going to not celebrate you anymore. Yes. And I praise God for those people who are still willing to put up with it and work from the inside to make the change. Yes. Some of those people that I, read, I wish they were MCC members, I, I would love for them to come over and be members with us. I, w I would love it if they left in mass, 
but I also know that the Holy Spirit has some of them placed there to work from the inside. You see, the Holy Spirit has, <laughs> has agents everywhere. I'm glad God called me out of that kind of background. I am. I am. And I want to tell you something else. After, after I, I gave that prophecy to my cousin, I sat down and she wrote back and she said, I'm just sitting here crying and crying. I know that God gave that word and I thank you for it. And, and then God gave me something else to, about her and talked about Hannah and all of that. And, and then the next morning, her husband, who I grew up with, she's, that cousin is 10 years younger than me. Her husband's my age. We went to school together, all our lives at church and school together. And, and I've known him all these years. And, and he wrote me, and I've never known him to utter the word Jesus or Lord or whatever because he has such a quiet faith. I didn't even know what he claims for himself. I know he's faithful to his church. He's faithful to his family. And he's just very quiet. But I got a text from him the next morning, first one I've ever gotten from him. He said, the, the word from the Lord you gave to Lisa really meant a whole lot. Now, where's mine? Where's mine? And you know what the Spirit showed me? Had I stayed there all those years ago, had I stayed there, I would have still been in that church with those people, and that would have been my audience. That would have been my sphere of influence. That would have been my message. And it wouldn't have gone very far. There's nothing wrong with that church. Don't get me wrong. God doesn't call us all to go running all over the world and do crazy things. Like Troy Perry. <laughs> right? And I have not done, I, I can't hold a candle to the things that Troy has done in his life. But I do know that he was my inspiration and you gave me the faith to step out sometimes when I didn't have the faith of my own. He blazed a trail for us you see and the spirit said some of that message was for you too I took you out from that I had to take you away from there or you wouldn't have this sphere of influence either you would not be preaching at the mother church of all denomination you wouldn't be preaching in front of a camera that's going out to people all over the world that wouldn't have been happening I'd have been happy in my little town in my little church just playing the piano. There's nothing wrong with that. Please, I'm not belittling. I'm just saying that sometimes God takes us way out of what we thought, what we had planned, all of those. But if I had abided by all those laws and rules and just kept seeing the law book, I'd have still been stuck there. But because I was willing to get out away from all of that, I kept pressing through it. I didn't have total peace. Even when the Spirit would move in me, I didn't have total peace. Because I wasn't being true to me. I wasn't being true to the spirit that was pushing me out to make something more of me. So I ask you, what are you going through? I know what some of you are going through. Some of you are going through illness. Some of it, when you, some of it is terminal enough that you're worried that you may not be here very long. I know that. Some of you think you're hiding it from other people and you're not. Some of you are going through relationship changes, and it is scary. It is scary, and it hurts. Even if you know it's the right thing, it hurts. Some of you have some addictions. And I want to be really careful here, but I want to be very firm. Some of you have, been, have addictions that everybody knows about, and you've made no secret. And that's okay. In fact, if we know about it, we can help you with it. And we can pray with you. If you want to be delivered, you can. I said, if you want to be, you can. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. But I also want those of you that are hiding your addictions to know you're not always hiding them so well that the rest of us don't know. Make sure you hear me. Some of you keep thinking, I can get through this. I can stop this on my own. 
I don't need any help. Some of you are already going to get help, but you're not following it. And some of you just think, well, I'll manage this. And I'm here to tell you today that you're not managing it as well as you think you are. And the reason I'm telling you that is because the Spirit prompted me to tell you. And it's not just in this congregation, it's the people looking online. I know, I know, I know there's some people that that's happening to. What is going on with those of you that are sitting in fear? Because fear is very real. I've never seen so much fear in America. I've never seen so much fear in Europe. As we're seeing right now with all of the conservative administrations that are happening. It scares people because people are, those of us that are marginalized are, are, are getting in worse shape. What about those dealing with depression? I brought that up a while ago. There are people that live with depression are having a lot of problems with it. One of our, our um, ministers, I, I was so blessed that she put it, she just put it out there, I need prayer. Here is a minister of the gospel, and she said, depression is a very real thing. Yeah. It is a very real thing. And what about those of you who are still searching for what is God's will for my life? Amen. That was a big question for me in my teenage years. And you know what? It's carried over through a lot of other years. Because I don't just want to know what God's will is for my life when I grow up. I want to know what God's will for my life is for today. Right. What do you want for me today, God? What can I do for you today, God? Because I want to be of service and I want to be blessed. But here's, here's what I want to leave you with if you're going through any of those things and other things. That last part of the reading, in fact, I'm going to add a couple of verses to it. I can't read it as well as <clears throat> Honetta did earlier. But I want to tell you, that was beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Hear what he says, the Apostle Paul, in his, I've been beat down and drugged down, and I used to be that dog biter and barker, and now I'm something else. He says, now hold on. I'm not saying that I have this all together, that I've made it. But I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Sometimes we forget that it's not just us reaching. God's reaching for us too. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. And here's where he goes a little farther. So let's keep focus on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. So I'm here to remind you just like Paul did. You've heard it all before. It's not new. It's not a new message. It's not a new word. But it's an important one that needs to be heard and heard and heard. And I'll probably preach it again. Yeah. I'm here to remind you one and all that whatever life has brought us, we must keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. Keep pressing on. Don't stop. Don't stop. God's got this, and I'm here to tell you that it's going to be all right. I know it because I have it on high authority. Not because I said so, but because God says so. Keep pressing on. Amen.
may be seated. Good morning, church. We've got a few announcements for you today. I am Roger Owens. I am the clerk of the BOD of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Um, our first announcement, we have 30 tickets for Outfest Fusion. It's an LGBTQ People of Color Film Festival, and it's going on now through March 5th. Our pastor, Reverend Keith, has tickets. Please see him. Please go out. Please um, help sponsor Outfest. Our second announcement is funding for our band to go to General Conference. We know it takes money, and we know that there is no room in the inn unless you pay for a room. <laughs> So please help us see Jane, see any of the choir band members um, for donations. We will take um, airline miles. We'll take anything just to get them there to Orlando in July. Uh, our own Ken uh, Ahn joins the Kids Club as assistant. So um, our Kids Club is at 11 a.m. and it's a vibrant, well-received kids club. So we're glad that we have a few extra people to help make that happen. Our own Scott Nash, who is in the choir, he has established himself as a notary republic and a life scan services. For those of you who have licenses, and know that you need to do a life scan or get something notarized, please see Scott. He's here at the church Monday through Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And you can always call him and he will come out and service you. <laughs> this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And um, we're doing something different. Our pastor says that he wants to be out there amongst the people. So we're doing imposition of ashes at the corner of Vermont and Prospect all day. So those people just passing by, they don't have to run into a church. They can get it right on the corner. Also here, 11 to 1 p.m. in the Chapel of Our Lady, and a 6 p.m. meditation service here will, will be followed by a service at 7 p.m. Come out, get your ashes, and show that you are part of God's family. Next Sunday, we have a special, special guest a friend of Reverend Keyes. Dr. Joyce Turner Keller will be our guest speaker at the 9 and 11 a.m. services. Dr. Joyce is a woman of color who also has HIV AIDS. She has been sharing her testimony in ministry for years, directing plays, teaching, speaking at conferences, and churches, and now one of those interviewed in the documentary, Noth Nothing Without Us. So come out. We're going to show the documentary in the Black Box Theater downstairs at 9 and 11, before 9 and 11, <laughs> because you're supposed to be at, I'm sorry? After both services, we will show the documentary downstairs in the Black Box Theater. So please come out and hear Reverend Dr. Joyce Turner speak. And something that is very close to my heart, many of you know that I grew up in Washington, D.C. And my, the picture you're seeing is of the National Museum of American History. My brother was a guard there, and I had the 
at 10 years old, I was allowed to go in after services, after the museum closed, and run around like a 10-year-old. And I realized at that point what a joy, what a treasure the Smithsonian is. It's free. It has treasures beyond belief. And we have one more treasure. On Monday, February 26th, Philip Buddy de Blet wrote this. I have always been proud of my husband, Reverend Troy Perry and all he has accomplished during his lifetime. But today was something extra special. The Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., National Museum of American History, has contacted Troy to request historical documents of his LGBT activism and the founding of the Metropolitan Community Churches to add to their collection. There can be no higher national praise than to have articles in the Smithsonian. We have, once again, we have arrived. Once again, we have shown the world who we are. Once again, we thank Troy Perry. And as our 50th anniversary said, this is just the beginning. Thank you. Please remain standing as you're able for the great thanksgiving and prayers of the people. And as we bless the offering, if you're comfortable and able to do so, please extend your right hand. God of the prophets, we bless this offering as people who have received your gifts of grace and hope. We return to you a portion of the abundance that you have given us. We dedicate all that we give to your loving purposes bringing in those who have been cast out, standing strong on behalf of those who are weak, speaking out with your word of joy and justice for all people. So as we continue to press on, may your loving realm increase in us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. May God be with you. And we lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to our God. It is a joyful, right, and good thing to give you thanks and praise, most holy and merciful God. Thank you for your tenderness, for your caressing wind and dancing trees, for the buzzing of the bees and the drenching raindrops. Thank you for those moments that make us feel alive inside when you invite us with eyes wide open to witness the absolute wonder of life that we are a part of. It is in this beauty that surrounds us, a bird song, the laughter of children, 
the wisdom of the elderly, 60 and plus, <laughs> the passionate kiss of those in love, the rich smell of homemade food, I'm in trouble, and my, my skin bristling with the kisses of your breeze. Could it be, could it be that for a moment, this joy is because we are connected to your divine joy? that generous and contagious joy that comes from knowing that you are calling each and every one of us by our names because you love us so. I thank you for the birthdays among us, for Reverend Keith and the wisdom given, and for Laura Law and so many, whether present or even watching us through cyberspace. God, thank you for loving us just as we are. Thank you for nudging us so that we can leave what we no longer need and reflect the very best of you in us. We pray this in your many holy names. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silence and give God thanks for the blessings received and to pray for those in need. For these and all the prayers that are on our hearts, both spoken and unspoken, we pray to God as we sing together uh, the prayer in the spirit of the way Jesus taught us to pray. Jesus, anointed by the Holy Spirit, preach the good news to the poor, hear the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, gave sight to the blind, and set free those who were oppressed. Through his baptism, death, and resurrection, he freed us from death and made a new covenant of water and spirit, promising to be with us through the living word and the Holy Spirit. And so we remember how before he was to be betrayed, he called those who had journeyed with him to break bread together, to love one another, and include all those who desired to share in this great table of fellowship. And so we remember on that night, Jesus took the bread, blessing it and breaking it. He said, take, eat, for this is my body, given for you. And likewise, after the meal had ended, he took the cup and said, Take, drink, for this is the cup of forgiveness, given for you and for all. Take and drink, all of you, for this is my blood, my life, 
This is my covenant with you. Do this in remembrance of me. God of love, mercy, and hope, just as the spirit of life inspired Jesus in his ministry, so now we pray that your Holy Spirit may breathe upon these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine, that they may be for us the life of Christ made real in us. May we be empowered to make that life visible through our actions of love and hope in the world. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen. So to prepare for the Feast of Love, I now invite the service acolytes and ushers to come forward. Here at Founders Metropolitan Community Church, uh, with MCCs all over the world, uh, we celebrate an open table. You do not need to belong to this church or any church to participate fully in this feast. And we have both gluten-free wafers uh, and regular wafers, you simply just need to ask your servant. Now, if you prefer to receive communion with no human intervention, please know that we have set aside sacred elements to our left, your right, where you can be at one with God. You are all welcome and invited at this table of love and mercy and freedom. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, come as the ushers guide you, for the feast is ready. All are welcome.
We want to thank you for being in worship here at Founders Metropolitan Community Church today. You are a joy. I hope you know that. Every single one of you are delightful. Not just to me, but to God. <laughs> but I'm glad too. Would you rise as you're able and join us in our closing song? Join us for cupcakes in the courtyard. Don't read too much into the subtle message of that song that I am a lot closer to heaven than I was yesterday. 
<laughs> Don't forget, I have the tickets here for the Outfest uh, that's going on today, tomorrow, and Tuesday, and free tickets for lots of films, really good stuff. I looked over the website, and it looks really wonderful. Um, I got a note, and somebody please confirm to me that next weekend is when we turn our clocks back. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so next weekend, next Saturday night, we turn our clocks one hour forward. Thank you for, I should read the note that was put in front of me. Turn our clocks one hour forward next week. Okay, don't forget that. And thank you for your, your birthday wishes. Let us pray. God, thank you for this time we've had to be in this place. And God, all of the things that life has brought us, we have pressed our way through, or most of us wouldn't be here. And so, God, we thank you for those times, even though they were hard, because we were pressing our way towards a higher calling, and that is the calling that you put on our lives, that you placed within us, and you have pulled us away sometimes from those things that were so precious to us in the past. And now we look at living in the freedom of God and how much more wonderful it is than those books of laws that we held so precious at one time in our lives. So now as we go forward, help us to show that same grace to all those around us and help us to be a blessing to everyone we come in contact with. We ask in the name of Jesus our Christ and all that is holy. Amen. 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 Shake hands and be friendly.